Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, peace be upon all of you. Uh, my name is Nurul Izzah Anwar. I am a reformed Democrat. And of course, uh, I'm also um, a member of parliament for Malaysia from the People's Justice Party. And I wanted to start here at this serious conference with a story uh, about two years back when the opposition leader of Malaysia, Anwar Ibrahim, was convicted on Trump Tuck and politically motivated charges. I actually spoke out in Parliament uh, in this conviction, was also condemned by the United Nations. And as I spoke against the corrupt judges who convicted the opposition leader, I found myself uh, investigated and arrested under Malaysia's archaic sedition laws. Now I wanted to tell you the time I spent in the lockup because it was such an important moment for me. I was separated from my two kids. It was extremely difficult. But surprisingly, I met with uh, another fellow inmate, a Vietnamese mother with her two children. Two young children who were also locked up. And that's when I understood the plight of undocumented migrant workers. I was also brought to meet a 14-year-old terrorist sympathizer. This 14-year-old girl, a Malaysian, was brought to me by the police who did not know what to do with her after one month. She was about to fly to uh, Syria or Iraq to marry, to be married off as an ISIS bride. So the police asked me, uh, YB, can you please advise her to de-radicalize her? Yeah? And I did what I could, but it's like a fellow prisoner trying to help um, a terrorist sympathizer. But this experience really gave me a sense of what are the key issues I'm fighting for. The first, of course, democratization in my country. The second, empowering women. And the third, for education, especially for Muslims, to ensure they are prevented from being radicalized. Now, my history traces uh, you know, the, year to the year of 1998. In that particular year, my father was the deputy prime minister then. He was uh, sacked, eventually jailed by the then Prime Minister Mahathir Mohamad. And of course, you know, I have to thank the government then. I could have been an engineer, but I joined politics instead. Now, it's very crucial because the moments at the time helped formulate this whole demand momentum for reforms to ensure that we had a systemic political reform that eventually culminated in the multiracial and multireligious People's Justice Party, the party of which I'm vice president of. Now, for me, it is very crucial to understand that in Malaysia, you know, I am a committed Malaysian. I love my country. There's many things going for us. Uh, but I feel, of course, you need to sustain the commitment for change. Now, eventually, after years in activism, I basically joined politics as an active politician in the year 2008. And I was very lucky to win in elections. I think some of the Malaysians here know I was against an incumbent minister, very popular minister for women, family and community development. So from there, nine years, yet I had the opportunity to be in politics. And eventually, for me, the ability to not only be first and foremost an activist, but also uh, to enter the foray of politics helped me understand that change requires you to always sort of have a more symbiotic relationship between activism, human rights, uh, rule of law, and of course, the field of uh, political process. I wanted to put this picture because it was the time that my two children and my nephew visited me when I was at the police station. Why is it important? Because when you strive for change, you also want to make sure the next generation understand the importance of you know, doing your bit, the dangers of an, an, an undemocratic government. I mean, these are very impactful. And I believe the more you engage, the more you give um, some impetus and inspiration to the younger generation, the more effective it is for you to change the world. Now, for me right now, our efforts in the political sphere, together with the non-governmental organizations, is to ensure this inclusive politics. You have to fight for multiracialism. You have to fight for multireligiosity. And the big problem is in Malaysia, of course, there are pressure points. 
You're talking about politics being discussed along racial, religious lines. You're talking about legitimate political dissent trying to be clamped down by the powers that be. And what happens when you try to silence legitimate political dissent? You actually encourage forces of extremism. I showcased this number from the Sufan International Report in 2015 to show you Malaysia has six times per capita more foreign fighters versus Indonesia, a much poorer country. I'm not saying that we have a huge problem. My point is, there's nothing wrong about being more inclusive, ensuring you increase the democratic space. And because of that, I believe, at the end of the day, fast forward in the year 2017, I find myself face to face with the former Prime Minister of Malaysia. I used to call him uh, my uh, most least liked dictator, Mahathir Mohamad. And, uh, you know, I feel the Islamic principles of our Satuha, moderateness, pragmatism, you need to be able to include all forces in demanding for reforms. This is not an issue about personal suffering, about personalities, about you know, your personal feelings. The issue is to prioritize the nation and the future. And that's why I basically chose this picture to showcase the importance of inclusion, to come together, to demand meaningful reforms. I would like to push for inclusivity. I would like to push for multiracialism. I would like to push for diversity. And I stand before you as a Muslim woman Democrat. And I thank you for according me the time to speak to you today. Thank you for hearing my story. Can you just tell me whether you were well treated uh, when you were uh, in prison? And can you share a little bit more about your first meeting uh, with Mahade Muhammad after everything? I think it's very important to understand um, the local policemen, the, the grassroots policemen, they were very, very kind, very civil. And I think they understood uh, the importance of looking up, making sure real criminals are arrested instead of members of parliament for speaking in. In, in the August House. So, I mean, I have no complaints. But my issue is regards the system that allows for, for example, uh, refugees, allows for undocumented workers and their children to be detained. And also, how much help they need. You're talking about a 14-year-old, eh, juvenile. If she's arrested for one month, you know, there must be support system, yeah? collaboration across the agencies to ascertain as to how a 14-year-old could be a terrorist sympathizer. So I think, you know, intelligence gathering, these things are some things that we can, even from the opposition, work together with the government. All stakeholders must be welcomed in this exercise to fight against this coward of, of terrorism, one. Number two, back to Mahathir. I mean, I must say, uh, the first time our eyes met, um, it was a, a very difficult moment, of course. You're talking about close to 20 years that has passed by, um, years of going throw and fro to the prison cell to visit my father. But I think we must understand that while you might hate a man for his actions, you must not personalize his being. So for me, I welcome everybody to be part of the reform agenda for as long as they are clear. There's no justification for any sort of uh, dictatorship or autocracy. When we demand for reforms, it means we have to demand for systematic reforms to ensure Malaysia you know, becomes a more successful, vibrant economy and country as it should be. So it was after a couple of times you know, of meeting, I think I was always taught to be civil. And eventually, believe it or not, we spent uh, Valentine's Day when I... No, not just with him, relax. Not just with him. I had a fundraising dinner, uh, 14th of February of this year. And I invited him, and uh, he came with his wife together with other politicians. So remember, if you continue in the pursuit of justice, with objectivity, with compassion, I believe the most autocrat of autocrats can be changed. Inshallah. It's inspired many, um, I mean, not only female here, but maybe I hope the male um, partner here too. Yes, I just hope. <laughs> but, you know, like I want to um, uh, learn more from you as well, you know, like being a female parliamentarian or politician. 
how do you um, face the, the, the barrier, perhaps, you know, gender barrier within the political system, within your own party, but also in the parliamentary or the country as a whole? Thank you. It's a very important question on gender equality in politics. I'm, I'm lucky because my father was a politician and, of course, then my mother was also the active opposition leader uh, at the beginning of our year. So I felt that I was luckier than most. But I think every woman who has had the opportunity must then provide the conducive environment. So when the party was formed, one of the first things we did was to ensure there's 30% representation for candidacies female candidacies, including training in the party. So it has to be institutionalized. You can't expect one, two personalities to change, to change the environment. So it has been difficult. Sometimes, you know, misogynists are everywhere. Sexism, you know, sometimes exists. But we must remain vigilant. You know, we have to support not just other women, but I think men who have, you know, clear-cut vision of empowering women, and there's many. So I think with that, when you focus on the agenda, you provide a conducive environment, I think many things can happen. But training, training, training. I wish I had um, many mentors, and more mentors would have helped, but uh, clearly it's about the environment. So there's word that there will be a general election in Malaysia this year or soon. How ready is your coalition to face the federal machinery? Because there are reports of problems that you're having and some you know, disagreements. So when the federal government is very, very much in line with, they move in one step. So how ready are you guys? Thanks so much for that question um, you know, um, from our ex friend. I, I think it's, it's very important to understand for elections in Malaysia is a great mystery. And there's a lot of rumors abound, but the person who really knows is either the prime minister or his wife. So it's a very, very well kept secret. But uh, pundits are saying it may be September this year. And I think our biggest challenge is really the unconstitutional gerrymandering of electoral boundaries. So I know gerrymandering happens everywhere. People mention the Trump versus Hillary numbers. But really, Malaysia is a champion of gerrymandering. So I think we are also racing against time. We have a coalition now in co consisting of four parties. My party, the DAP, Amana as well as. Surprise, Mahathir's party. So I think, you know, our position is strengthen policy offerings. And we are doing our bit to work with non-governmental organizations because voters, the voter list, these issues will determine the outcome of elections. We won 52% last elections, but we only received 40% of the seats, parliamentary seats. So the huge disparity doesn't help matters, but I feel uh, kin commitment and we are also going to uh, generate enough awareness from the electorate in this regard. So it's going to be an uphill battle. Uh, I do not deny that, but um, you know, I am an incorrigible optimist. How would your new government run the country different from the incumbent government today? Thank you for the question, uh, Mr. Poon. I, I think we have highlighted a few things that we would do differently. A reform is, has formed our main agenda. The Prime Minister shouldn't hold the position of the portfolio of the Finance Minister. There has to be clear-cut separation of powers. You have to empower the Attorney General's chambers, for one thing, to be brave enough to take action against any corrupt doers, regardless of their position. Yeah? But on the media, on the other civil society side, I think you have to ensure you have free and fair media, there has to be a re removal of the strangleholds through the existing printing presses and publications act because a vibrant media will then act as the fourth estate monitoring all the different levels of, of governance and politicians. So for me, the reform agenda, the first 100-day plan is very crucial. We are formulating it in the Pakatan Harapan level. There's the name of our coalition to those of you who are not Malaysian sometimes. I'm sorry, I always assume everyone's Malaysian. But I think these are the key reform agenda and reform pledges that we hope will push Malaysia to be a country which is already successful but far better, you know, able to be salvaged from the hands of corrupt wrongdoers. You've come here for this forum and what I'd like to know is moving forward, what are your things that you need coming out from this forum? Thank you. Three things. I, 
you know, I was very happy to be part of the World Economic Forum ASEAN level because, you know, as, as I was growing up, there's so much linkages between us as a region. You know, you know all the main poets and more, uh, main uh, leaders from Philippines to Indonesia. You know, there's that sense, you know, sense of convivencia that gave us a lot of um, pride in being in ASEAN, Southeast Asian. Uh, and I think the three things that I've learned is, first, the issue of how vibrant we are as a region. There was so much talk about a TPP, but really, I mean, who are the main partners in terms of our trading uh, um, you know, in, in the region? So I thought that RCEP should have formed um, you know, much more um, discussion, engagement between us. Uh, the second, of course, the disparity um, in terms of the economies in ASEAN. I feel that this forum has helped me learn from so many talents because, yes, there might be disparity, but there's no blockage from ensuring intellectual achievements can be achieved by anybody, you know, regardless of race, regardless of creed. So, and, and the third bit is also learning from the investors on their impression of Malaysia's civil service. You see, they have a lot of great things to say about our civil service. Maybe less on the politicians, but civil service, you know, uh, received the great mark. So these three things um, helped me get a sense on how beneficial it is for Malaysia to be part of this of this grouping. And I hope that um, you know from this story again, like I said, Malaysia has a lot to offer. Malaysia and Malaysians can definitely do more. And I hope as a region, we can really galvanize our strengths to focus and propel each other forward. I was uh, forced also to answer a question, is Malaysia ready for a female prime minister? And I think it's not for me to answer, it is for the electorates in Malaysia to answer. But first and foremost, let's get a good prime minister. So on that note, ladies and gentlemen, I think my time is up. Thank you very much.